run out of time. Thank you very much. Cheers, Gibbs. The murder of the MI6 agent Alexander Litvinenko in London in November 2006 was just one of a host of reasons why British relations with Russia have been so bumpy in recent years. Syria and what to do about the Assad regime is another of the most obvious. While today the British and Russian foreign and defence ministers got together to try to focus not on what they disagree about but where they can agree and start to repair relations. For an insider's glimpse of what might be possible, Newsnight's Tim Hewell has gone to Moscow to talk to a key player in the Kremlin, Alexei Pushkov. Chairman of the Russian Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. Two years into an uprising that descended into civil war, there are many partial explanations for why the Syrian regimes proved so hard to overthrow. One, often given in the West, is that President Assad has an ally in Russia that supplies him militarily and defends him diplomatically. The war, according to that version, might already be over if it wasn't for Moscow's intransigence. That's not how it's seen here in Moscow. For the Kremlin, the Syrian struggle's not between dictatorship and democracy, it's between order and chaos. Russia, which suppressed its own Islamic insurgency in Chechnya, now fears that the Arab Spring is spreading Islamist militancy across the Middle East. And that's one of the things the Russian foreign and defence ministers wanted to try and impress on their British counterparts in London today. When I spoke here to the head of the Russian Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, Alexei Pushkov, he told me he thought the West was beginning to share Russia's fears. I think that uh, after a year of Russian warnings, uh, the West finally understood that people who are fighting um, the government in Syria, at least in part, are the same people who are blowing up American soldiers in Iraq, killing them in Afghanistan, and killing American diplomats in Benghazi. They basically belong to the same type of political forces. David Cameron has now said that specifically because of the danger of extremist elements among the rebels in Syria, that for that reason it might be a good idea to arm moderate elements to ensure that extremist elements don't come to the fore. What do you think about that? I think it's, it never works this way. It never works this way. The United States uh, uh, were arming the Mujahideen in Afghanistan against the Soviet troops in the 80s. And finally, they got basically a very uh, radical, extremist, anti-American force coming to power in Afghanistan, the Taliban movement. You cannot t make a wall between uh, the uh, moderate armed opposition and the extremist armed opposition. There is no wall between them. Uh, they are on the same side. They are fighting close to one another. And uh, I think that if the decision is taken, either in Britain or in the United States, to send weapons there, they will finally Evidently, they will be uh, shared between the so-called moderate forces and the so-called extremist forces. Isn't it, though, in a sense, Russia that's prolonging the war in Syria by giving President Assad the sense, and many would say, the illusion that he can hang on and even that he can win? I think that President Assad thinks that he can still be in power and control a large part of the Syrian territory because the opposition is not strong enough to dislodge him. And that's the main reason. But shouldn't you be telling him, as, as, as a close partner of, uh, of Syria, shouldn't Russia be telling him he's, uh, in, he's under an illusion? I think it is not an illusion. I've been in Syria a year ago. Uh, and uh, since that time, uh, President Assad's positions uh, had weakened significantly, but not to the point when he can should take his suitcases and ran immediately from Damascus. What is Russia telling Mr. Assad is that we should start negotiations. We should uh, have a possibility to start a dialogue which uh, ha has to begin with a ceasefire. And what Russia tells, tells to Mr. Assad is that there is no way of winning this war militarily. Is it possible though that Russia as part of the talks with President Assad, might consider offering him asylum in Russia or, or helping to organize asylum or safe passage to a third country? I don't think that the question of Mr. Assad's asylum uh, is on the table. 
As I said, Mr. Assad controls about 70% of the territory of Syria. No ruler in these conditions will run out of his country. If we look back over the last few years, Saddam Hussein has gone, Colonel Gaddafi has gone, and one of the main criticisms of Russian foreign policy is that it's actually against Russia's own national interests, because in the end, again and again, you keep backing the losers. The biggest uh, loser from the Iraqi war, I think, were the United States, from the point of view of their public image, international image, and level of trust to the American foreign policy. It was a devastating blow for the American foreign policy. So while the United States think they have won the war, they have lost the trust of a large part of the world. So I think the question of losers as winners is much more complicated than this. Aren't the Western nations a bit tired of nation building? You have been doing nation building in Afghanistan, in Iraq, for 10, 12 years. Aren't you tired a bit? The only government which exists in Syria is, is the present government. That, that's they, they who are running the economy, you know, uh, looking after central electric stations and so on and so on. You have to have some governance in Syria. Do you think those Salafist rebels connected to Al-Qaeda will make this governance in Syria? It will be a failed state if they come to power. We've seen the start now of this new dialogue between Russia and Britain that begins today. But we've also got, for example, coming up quite shortly, the inquest into the death of Alexander Litvinenko, which will inevitably throw up again allegations against Russia. In general, do you think that relations between Britain and Russia are getting better or getting worse? I think they are definitely getting better. Uh, the reason is that uh, whatever the um, consequences of the Litvinenko case and the public opinion, it's already behind us. Uh, it didn't really work between Mr. Blair and Mr. Brown and the Russian presidents. Why? I think that Mr. Blair uh, could not be considered an independent politician. He was running the 52nd state of the United States. Uh, and uh, it was not Russia who called him the poodle of uh, George Bush. I think it was somebody in England. Uh, Mr. Cameron seems to be a, at least a, a British politician, not an American prime minister in, in London. Uh, so um, I think that uh, he has a sense of national interest of Britain. Uh, I think that uh, he struck a good tonality in his relationship with Mr. Putin, a realistic tonality. He saw that Russia is a country which is offering a lot of opportunities from, for, for the British business. I think that uh, Mr. Cameron, uh, he assessed the R Russia as a, as a big economic opportunity for the British business in the times of crisis. That's what I think.